the time of the bicentennial in 1976, looking at the last the 30, 40 years before that, the definition of Americanism had changed very, very dramatically and expanded very dramatically. The immigration law of 1965 had uh, ended the quota system, which had stigmatized various parts of the world as unworthy of uh, immigration to the United States and had opened the door to a considerable uh, diversification. The civil rights movement had tremendously expanded, obviously, the rights of African Americans and had inspired similar movements among many other groups. With the emergence of black power, brown power, uh, Asian power, women's power during this period, uh, it, it's impossible not to understand that there was, in fact, a kind of a retribalization, if you will, of American society in which different groups of people saw the benefit of seizing and seeking new ways of self-identity, new ways of self-expression, new ways to empower themselves politically and socially. Uh, this is the period where identity politics begins to emerge. Now, that has both good and bad effects. Uh, on the one hand, it creates a kind of pride in self, in one's group, in one's heritage. But on the other hand, it creates a kind of divisiveness, which, to some extent, I think, still exists today. When we start thinking about getting our own little piece of the pie based uh, on how we define ourselves, I think the tendency uh, is, is natural to forget that we also started to try to build coalition across those lines. By the mid-1970s, there was widespread recognition that even though you have legal rights, there still is a gulf between rich and poor. There's, there still are questions about um, how far should anti-discrimination laws go uh, to deal with the consequences of past oppression. You know, are we simply going to say that everybody is now equal and there's no longer any formal barriers, or do we actually try to deal with, with the enormous uh, consequences of years and years of discrimination? The struggle by the 1970s is a struggle for an end to discrimination in not only in the economic sphere, in jobs and housing and so on, but in schools and in um, marital and family uh, relationships, leading us, I think, rather slowly, but still leading us towards a moment where such personal freedoms become the central issue. Already at that time also, a different definition of freedom was uh, growing more prominent, which would become dominant in the 1980s and 90s, which was a throwback, you might say, to the older negative government view of freedom, of laissez-faire, of lack of uh, regulation, of letting people uh, act as they see fit without any outside interference. So we, as always, you had different strands of ideas, but the dominant idea was still very much this notion of equality for all as the basis of freedom. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. In 1964, conservative Barry Goldwater ran for president on the Republican ticket. One of the highlights of his campaign was a televised speech given by a Hollywood actor whose star had been waning. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. This is the issue of this election. Goldwater lost the election, but Reagan's speech raised his own political profile and gave him the momentum to run for governor of California two years later. Goldwater and Reagan represented a growing backlash of political and social conservatism emerging around the country. 
The conservatives in, in the 1960s were not a united group in the sense that there were divisions among them um, over political strategies, over tactics, over and in terms of their uh, world views and their priorities. But they were nonetheless united in terms of their opposition to what they saw as a collective enemy, namely American liberalism. The conservative movement was made up of economic conservatives on the one hand and social and religious conservatives on the other. For the latter, it was the women's movement that posed the biggest threat. In the 1970s, the Equal Rights Amendment became a lightning rod. Equality of rights under the law should not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. We in the second wave thought, oh, well, this is just this little leftover thing, you know, it won't be hard. <laughs> so we didn't understand its transformational power. What everyone assumed was that, well, everybody agrees that women are equal now, and we need to write this in the Constitution just the way we wrote the 14th Amendment to um, essentially make men equal. Um, what they didn't understand, that for a minority, but for a very large minority of Americans, this strikes at the foundation of the biblical family. We started an organization called Stop ERA with a specific purpose of defeating the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, then as the years went on, what I think that I did was to create what we now call the pro-family movement. So I put together the, uh, the Catholics and the Baptists and the Methodists and the Mormons and the Orthodox Jews, and many people who had never been together before, uh, may have been slightly suspicious of each other, and told them we're all going to work together to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment uh, because we all saw it as a threat on the values we cared about. If these amendments are put on the floor of the House, they will pass. The first main tactic we did was to go to the state legislatures and ask them to hold a hearing. And all we needed was equal time, and we could convince anybody that there is no benefit that anyone was ever able to show that ERA would give women. At the same time, we were able to present a whole catalog of unhappy results. Abortion funding, gay rights, drafting women. They were saying that it would permit homosexual marriage, which is not true at all. They were saying that it would integrate bathrooms, not true. They were saying that it would force women into combat, not true. It foundered not on American public opinion, which always supported it in the majority. It foundered on two things, I think. One is the nature of state legislatures, or many state legislatures, who controls them. And the other was the media, because the media was content to cover it 50-50. So you got one group saying it would destroy Western civilization as we know it and integrate bathrooms <laughs> and the other group saying, no, wait a minute, it already exists in Pennsylvania, it's not doing that, you know, so, and it, it publicized uh, falsehoods. So the more coverage there was of it, the more confusion there was. I think it was a tremendous victory and terribly important for the sake of our Constitution, our whole system of government, uh, as well as politics. It benefited women and the family because it kept us from being forced into this gender-neutral society where you have no more respect, say, for the husband, breadwinner, wife, homemaker role, which the feminists disdain. The base over the ERA helped to galvanize a conservative constituency. In many places, that conservative constituency was connected to conservative religiosity. That, in turn, becomes part of the moral majority. It becomes part of the new kind of direct mailing campaigns that take place to mobilize a conservative constituency. And I think it's very important in terms of the base that develops for people like Ronald Reagan, uh, who are very, very effective at tapping into those traditional values and invoking those traditional images of flag, worship of God, belief in traditional institutions like the family. It was a tremendous benefit to the conservative movement. 
because it brought new people into politics who had never been in politics before. And the other point was it taught the conservative movement that we could win. Control one house of the Congress for the first time in a quarter of a century. During most of 1980, President Jimmy Carter's re-election seemed likely. Though his record was mixed and his administration beset by problems, voters found his integrity and personal commitment appealing. But events largely beyond his control quickly weakened his position. I think Jimmy Carter must be one of the most unlucky presidents in our modern history. He inherited an enormous economic problem with the oil crisis, the invasion of Afghanistan. And then, of course, most of all, you had the Iranian crisis. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. In which our diplomats were essentially imprisoned, and we were helpless. Carter's Republican opponent in the 1980 presidential campaign was Ronald Reagan, who had by now served two terms as governor of California. Ronald Reagan's philosophy, I wouldn't call it a bumper sticker mentality, but it was pretty simple. Government is a problem, not the solution. We have inflation because the government is living too well. Reagan comes along at an interesting time. So some of that backlash that we've talked about, clearly sentiment that is percolating in huge sectors of the American populace and, and the electorate. He was able to identify those particular points that, that a lot of Americans say, well, yeah, he's really right. Isn't government too big? He's a folksy fellow. He talked common talk. A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose yours. Bottom line, he's a populist president with a populist message that resonates. Are you better off than you were four years ago? A lot of Americans liked what they heard and thought that, well, maybe this is a, a fellow who can actually, we can get behind. I like the way he talked about the pride in America and America being good. He didn't have any uh, problem communicating to people sort of a vision and a real drive and a passion for being American. I thought that was very important. He had a nice, smiling, pleasant personality. And, he, and uh, I liked him. I, I just, the way he acted. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. On November 4th, 1980, voters went to the polls and elected Ronald Reagan by a landslide as the 40th president of the United States. His election represented a major shift in the political landscape. The significance of his success was quite dramatic for conservatives. Uh, Reagan made a statement to a group of conservatives following his uh, electoral win where he said, our time has come. Our moment has arrived. In addition to winning the presidency, the Republican Party picked up seats in both houses of Congress and gained control of the Senate. This would help Reagan enormously to push through some of the principal initiatives of his agenda. I shall ask for a 10% reduction across the board in personal income tax rates. What he did succeed in doing, it seems to me, is in promoting these ideas, in working and attacking the margins of the welfare state, restricting it, cutting back. So that was, from his perspective, an accomplishment. And the greatest thing of uh, accomplishment, I'm sure, from his perspective, was he enormously increased military expenditures. In fact, that's why he had such a hard time balancing the budget, that and tax cuts for the rich. In 1984, Ronald Reagan was re-elected in yet another landslide victory. Despite scandals and blunders, Reagan continued to remain popular throughout his presidency, leading pundits to dub him the Teflon president. I will keep America moving forward. All... In 1988, Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, was elected to succeed him, ensuring that the Reagan legacy would remain intact. 
Reagan revolution is often used to describe the triumph of conservatism, uh, of unabashed, open, unrestricted conservatism. Even there, I'd say it's a partial revolution. He didn't shave social spending to the extent that he said he was going to be. In fact, there are parts of the agenda, the military agenda, and the, the heating up of the Cold War where expenditures rise dramatically. So the role of government, but in a different form, is, uh, is actually expanding tremendously. But I think the, the messages that he's conveying, the ideas that he wanted to bring to his policy platform, those are the things that we talk about the Reagan revolution. What he did succeed in doing was uh, making uh, conservatism not only respectable, but even the dominant um, rhetoric in American politics. Even liberals had to respond to that after the Reagan years. I'm getting sick and tired. I am every single night here in one of these carping little liberal Democrats jumping all over my you know you know what. And I can't wait. One of the great achievements of the conservative movement of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s was to make the word liberal a dirty word. Collectively, conservatives saw liberal as synonymous with lack of self-restraint. The most extreme aspects of the countercultural movement uh, become associated with liberalism. Instead of saying a liberal is someone who believes in equal rights, equal opportunities, believes in social security, believes in health care, they ended up trying to hide and uh, say, well, I'm not a liberal, I'm just a moderate. And I think what that did was to allow the conservatives to define liberalism. By occupying what had come to be the new center, Democrats believed they could appeal to a wider range of voters. They were led in this effort by William Jefferson Clinton, an upstart young governor from Arkansas who combined the telegenic media savvy of Reagan, the soulfulness of a bleeding heart liberal, and the politics of both. Democratic Leadership Council, of which Clinton was, was of course, a uh, critical part in the late 80s and the early 90s, tried to come up to, to articulate and to lay out new Democratic Party positions on a number of issues. We're going to get tough on crime, for example. We're going to be more cautious about spending. We're going to be more responsible stewards of the public's money. And we're not going to be those tax and spend uh, Democrats that Republicans are always talking about. We need jobs. We sure do. I want you to vote for me because I'm the only fellow running that's had to create jobs. Clinton was a masterful campaigner, and he got better and better at it. And he understood that although these other conservative issues were important, that right in that critical 92 window there, that the economy was what was important. And people were concerned about jobs. All those factors together, Clinton's skills as a campaigner, Bush's weaknesses, I think, and the economy created the kind of, if not a perfect storm, something like it in 92. Early in his first administration, Clinton made several attempts at instituting liberal policies that ended in failure. His don't ask, don't tell approach to gays in the military pleased no one, while his health care reform package was resoundingly defeated by Congress. This was a real body blow to Clinton because he had staked his early career political presidency on getting that health care program through. And by the end of the time, uh, it was a failure in just about every way. At the same time... This is a total mess, and it's about to get messier. It gave the Republicans an issue to argue that Bill Clinton was the same old tax and spend. Democrats, he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Sweeping victories in the 1994 midterm elections gave Republicans control of both the House of Representatives and the Senate, effectively tying Clinton's hands. Just as 92 may have been a perfect storm uh, in terms of electing Clinton, 94 was a perfect storm for the Republicans because they had a skilled practitioner of the slash and burn politics in Newt Gingrich. The rhetoric that increasingly I think dominates American political life really is is refined to an extraordinary degree in that campaign and, and it was Gingrich himself 
who handed out a series of um, words to be used uh, whenever describing de Democrats, degenerate, tax and spend. And in, in the 1994 campaign, it worked. Often accused of governing by public polls, Clinton responded to the shift in public opinion by trimming his own political sales. In 1996, he signed the Welfare Reform Act, legislation bitterly opposed by liberal Democrats. Despite Clinton's political centrism, he inspired deep resentment and rage in Republican conservatives, who deemed him dishonest and untrustworthy. Midway through his second term, their accusations and investigations finally caught up with him, when he was trapped in a lie about his relationship with a young White House intern. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Mr. Burns, guilty. Bill Clinton was impeached primarily because of the, um, the polarization of American politics in the 1990s, I think. Many Republicans simply did not regard him as a legitimate president. Um, that's the first factor. Um, the second factor is the um, Bill Clinton was impeached because he did a number of very stupid things. But there's a third factor, I think, and that is the inability and the failure of the media to penetrate and to put these issues in context. Even though when it was finally all over and done with, the American people weren't convinced. Clinton's popularity ratings remained high throughout the impeachment. This can be, and this must be, a time of reconciliation. In the end, Clinton remained in office, but his effectiveness as president had been deeply compromised and his personal reputation badly tarnished. Clinton's failures frequently overshadowed his accomplishments, but he did succeed where others before him had failed. Whether through luck, he was partly lucky, but through his own skills and his own commitment, he brought the American political uh, fiscal house into order. The United States, which had been facing escalating um, deficits uh, through the Reagan years, by the end of the, um, uh, the Clinton years, was running um, surpluses, something that's almost unheard of in our modern history here. And that was an enormous accomplishment because it created the kind of economic framework in which we had one of the longest, most sustained periods of, of economic growth that we've had uh, since the 1960s. The presidency is more than a popularity contest. It's a day-by-day -day fight for people. In the 2000 presidential race, Vice President Al Gore ran as a centrist Democrat. The Republican candidate, George W. Bush, son of the former President Bush, delivered a campaign message that emphasized his own strength of character and a return to moral leadership. It is conservative to confront illegitimacy. It is compassionate to offer practical help to women and children in crisis. By identifying with traditional democratic issues, such as education, he tried to position himself in the political center, but many of his ideas and proposals echoed those of Ronald Reagan. The 2000 presidential election was one of the closest in history. American voters were almost evenly split on the two candidates, while an insurgent third-party campaign argued that it was hard to tell the difference. In the country, I wouldn't begin to compare the Green Party platform with the flaccid, insipid, empty, cowardly platforms of the Democratic and Republican Tweedledum Tweedledee party. In the end, it came down to Florida where voting irregularities, mechanical errors, and allegations of voter fraud led to lawsuits and counter-lawsuits between the two parties. After a month of battling it out in court, in the media and on the streets, the matter was settled by the Supreme Court. George Bush became president in 2000 because five justices of the Supreme Court decided he ought to be president of the United States. He did not win a majority of the vote, but he got close enough on the Electoral College that uh, when you had the disputed Florida votes, the courts decided to award them to him, and uh, thus he became president. Whereas Reagan was a philosophical conservative and an ideological one who articulated these conservative ideas, operationally he was pretty cautious and didn't really attack the main stage of the liberal state head on. We know that deep, persistent poverty 
is unworthy of our nation's promise. George Bush, on the other hand, he was going to bring compassion to conservatism. But when he became president, he, I think, was much more conservative than any president we've ever had. You'd have to go back Calvin Coolidge to find someone who's as conservative. The president is telling us that inflation is because you and I have been living too well. We have inflation because the government is living too well. Read my lips. No new the era of big government is over. I'll be guided by conservative principles that government ought to do a few things and do it well. I think the legacy of the resurgence is since 1980, conservatives have really challenged the whole uh, conception of the role and responsibility of uh, federal government for uh, economic and social justice or for providing a floor for its citizens. On the one hand, I think the majority of Americans are now accept the notion that government ought to play a less and less role in American life. And yet, they want mama to have that social security check. They want their Medicare when they get to be 65. They want clean air, they want clean water, they want parks. They want all these things. The schizophrenia comes from their belief that somehow they can have them without having to pay for them. The irony is that Bill Clinton did more to cut back on big government and cut back on budget expenditures than either Reagan, Bush 1, or Bush 2. The government has grown as much, if not more, under Republican administrations than it has under Democratic administrations. I don't think the era of big government is over. When if you really did scale it back in dramatic ways, people would be crying. Bloody murder. We'd have to look over almost a century for you to understand how we've moved to a government that is, that is monstrous and gob gobbling up a huge amount of tax um, revenues to provide the services for Americans and national security. So I think it, it's something that Americans have really come to understand. It's, it's here with us, and it's probably here to stay.